In this, McGloggin was agreeable, for he was a Highlander and had ideas about the Celtic races. They would, be fa- they would found a society to bring back the gods, which would have, its foundation, the grail, have as its foundation the grail stories. Hearn would supply the needed grail symbolism acquired in the numerous visions, while McGloggin would put all his magical knowledge into it and into the teaching that was given to initiates, and more would come to them in dreams and visions as they worked, discovering, quote, wonderful correspondences between the earth and all that is above it. That is a great indicator of the as below, so above argument I'm making in my new Hermeticism book. Because people have been not paying close attention to their Latin. Ha ha, fucking idiots. It may be accurate to say that Yeats' novel gives a fairly clear picture of the way Yeats and Mathers work together, first on the Golden Dawn matters, but also on the Celtic mysteries, which are blended together into one order in the novel. Together they, quote, wrote out abstracts of various old methods of evocation or new methods made by the old plan, and they spent days studying and writing out abstracts of Eastern systems of contemplation. As they worked, they got sometimes in dreams, sometimes in waking illuminations, successions of new symbols or elaborate and subtle doctrines. It's an extract from The Speckled Bird. But even more autobiographical than this is Hearn's relationship with Margaret Henderson, who is clearly a portrait of Maud Gone. She, in fact, supplies the motivation for Hearn's work on the mystical rites in much the same way that hope of winning a fair woman motivated Yeats to building a vague dream of impossible adventures in which she had a chief part. In the excitement following a splendid vision of the girl with bronze-like hair, whom he saw floating with her feet a few inches above the sea, Hearn feels that his life had begun and everything was certain. He would marry Margaret and they would dam up the stream of the world and make it flow into a new bed. He rhapsodizes her, I shall make a little kingdom, a part of the great kingdom to come, and I will ask her to sit beside me as its queen. We will only make a beginning but centuries after we are dead cities shall be overthrown. It may be because of an air that we have hummed or because of a curtain full of meaning that we have hung upon a wall. Yeah, that is some awkward prose for a novel. Oh, well. That's probably why he wrote three versions and never finished it. Like Maud, however, Margaret refuses to become high priestess in Hearn's religion. (laughs) Instead, she marries the rough and ready Captain John Peters, modeled on Maud's husband, John McBride. Maud married McBride on 21st February 1903 in Paris. The marriage ended in dear two years, ending in 1905. Like Maud, however, the marriage is not a success, and after a year, she sends for Michael. (laughs) Oh, he hates When her friend Harriet St. George gives Michael both the news of the marriage and the summons, he cries out, Oh, why did she marry? I was doing everything for her. You cannot think what a great work I have been doing here, and it was all for her I was doing it. Well, that basically tells us pretty clearly why it was perhaps dedicated so much to the Celtic mysteries. The things we do for love. Of course, when Michael Hearn says it is... Of course, what Michael Hearn says is not altogether an accurate reflection of his motivation in creating the order. Like Yeats, Hearn was striving to embody in ritual and symbolism the eternal truths of the broken race that still remembered the reveries of ancient herdsmen among woods and waters. He had been seen the queen of the fairy, uh, fairy in visions. He had seen the queen of the fairy in visions and therefore knew that certain truths still lingered in the legends of the common folk. The fishermen of today, he wrote, talk of the same things the shepherds talked of before there was a town in all of Europe. He wanted to share their thoughts and emotions, but with more subtlety and delicacy in order to have the wisdom of Odysseus as distinguished from modern wisdom. (laughs) The rites he was to create would be an outward manifestation of the inward condition revealed through symbol and the beauty of design. Hearn wanted Margaret as Yeats wanted Maud, as the jewel in the crown he was fashioning for himself. 
When Margaret sends for him after a year of marriage, Hearn entertains hopes that she wants him to take her away. Instead, she tells him she loves him with a sisterly, sister's love. They do, however, reach a greater intimacy than they had had before, achieving a spiritual marriage not unlike that experienced by Yeats and Maud uh, under similar circumstances. As the two wander the hills of Glenna, Glenna Mashi, Yeats was notoriously bad Irish, Margaret says, if only you could meet in the spirit, if we could get out of our bodies and meet in the spirit. I often dream of you and I think dreams are realities. Sounds like Yeats <laughs> talking about Maud rather than the other way around. It just doesn't seem like she was very attracted to him. At last, Margaret can endure her marriage to Peters no longer, and she asks Michael to take her away. They make plans to meet in Galway and to go from there to Dublin and from Dublin to France. But the plans go awry. Margaret, finding herself pregnant and unable to take her as yet unborn child from its father, resigns herself to her fate and cancels the escape. Footnote, Margaret's pregnancy and her unwillingness to leave her husband because of it is a reflection of circumstances surrounding Maud's pregnancy. She refused to leave McBride until after the birth of Sean McBride. How different times would have been if women had some form of, uh, you know, birth control. Meanwhile, Hearn and McLaughlin have a disagreement have a disagreement based on some very real, real philosophical differences. As McLaughlin put it, he had come to recognize that Hearn was not a magician, but some kind of an artist, and that the summum bonum itself, the, the potable gold of our masters, was less to him than some charm of color or some charm of words. Harsh. Or as Yeats wrote in a note to the novel, the antagonism must be made the antagonism between the poet and magician. It's an interesting theme for a novel, uh, perhaps obtuse to the common reader, um, but interesting, unique. This statement may be as valid an assessment of the primary reason for the real-life disagreement between Yeats and Mathers as it is for the fictional one. For as a poet, Yeats saw all spiritual exercises, including the Golden Dawn and the Celtic Mysteries rituals, as metaphors for poetry. The Celtic Mysteries, as Yeats himself said, had given him endless symbols to his hand. McLaughlin, in contrast, held the practical magician's point of view and actively disliked any ideas which he could not understand. For him, external forms were only to be judged on spiritual, not artistic merits. As Yeats reminded himself in a note to the novel, when Michael and McLaughlin are talking at his rooms, McLaughlin must point out to Michael that his attempts at writing a ritual will not do, as they are too like a play. I have so much to say on that, but I near the now is not the time. As we know, the Celtic mystery rituals that Yeats did create are indeed very like spiritual dramas. Yeah, <clears throat> psychodramas, initiations like Steiner's and all the spiritual mystery plays and initiations have always been like that, so I'm not really sure. Maybe that was Mathers' uh, masonry coming out a bit. Uh, yeah, I don't want to get into that. As indeed the plays he wrote are very like rituals for a long forgotten religion. That's awesome. Yeats wrote the in Explorations on one of his books that he wanted to create for himself a, an, unpop, an unpopular theater and an audience like a secret society where admission is by favor and never to many. Sounds like a, an initiatory order. Or mystery school. Certainly this desire formed part of Yeats's motivation for creating the Celtic Mysteries. His rituals were designed to be powerful dramas differing from ordinary drama in that everyone who hears it is also a player. That's from his book, Explorations. The novel ends inconclusively. Ten years later, Hearn, on his way to Persia and Arabia, stops off in Paris to visit McLaughlin and his pretty new wife, who, paralleling their real-life models, had developed a cult of Isis and Osiris. Hearn learns from McLaughlin that the London Order had ousted him. Therefore, they had come to Paris to begin again. They, uh, of course, Yeats in real life was part of the ousting of Mathers and sending him to Paris in his novel. It's interesting that Yeats's version of himself, Hearn, distances himself radically from actually the role he played with Florence Farr 
uh, in ousting Mathers, mainly to bring back in Annie Horniman, who had been expelled by Mathers for cutting off funding to Mathers. It was ridiculous, Mathers being such a twat. Um, they talk for a while, and the next day, McLaughlin accompanies Hearn to the railway station. After rece- receiving a large check from Hearn, <laughs> McLaughlin grasped his hand affectionately, and the last thing that Michael saw as he looked back towards the platform was McLaughlin watching him with those heroic eyes. Yeah, he has really loved Mathers, but he had principles and didn't like how Mathers was treating his financial backer and friend, Annie Horniman. Though the novel is ultimately unsatisfying, Yates set forth in that last conversation between McLaughlin and Hearn a concept of extreme importance to any understanding of Yeats's philosophy of literature. Like his fictional spokesman, Hearn, Yeats had begun to associate natural emotion with the paganism of the Irish peasants. Hearn was convinced now that the symbols of Christianity must be the center expression, central expression, but they must be really Catholic. Men must come to think of Christ as a need to be slain for the foundation of the world and perhaps not slain at all in Judea. At any rate, Christian mysteries must inhabit every land equally, and above all, they must be reconciled to the natural emotions. He was going to the east now, to Arabia and Persia, where they would where he would find among the common peoples, people so soon as he had learned their language, some lost doctrines of reconciliation. It sounds like a kid going to India to find himself in his 20s. And then discovering, oh, it's just another country with the same crap and the same mysteries as the place they left. The philosophic poets had made sexual love their principal symbol of a divine love and he had seen somewhere in a list of untranslated Egyptian manuscripts that certain of them dealt with love as the Palthugic yeah that's a un, that that's a word from the original manuscript that was not written correctly and it's hard to see what word it was intended Palthugic power in Ireland, he had found wonderful doctrines among the poor, doctrines which had been the foundation of the old Irish poets, and surely he would find somewhere in the East a doctrine that would reconcile religion with the natural emotions and at the same time explain these emotions. All the arts sprang from sexual love, and therefore they would only come again in the garb of a religion when that re- reconciliation had taken place. In a letter to the editor of Outlook, written between 16 and 23rd April 1898, Yeats defended his article, The Broken Gates of Death, Fortnightly Review, April 1898, against the charge of being, quote, the dream of a poetic folklorist by insisting that the Irish peasant has, has invented, or that somebody has invented for him, a vague, though not altogether unphilosophical reconciliation between his paganism, i.e. the belief of the fairies, and his Christianity. It's actually very true how much in Ireland, even to this day, the blend between pagan gods, worship, and fairies, and Christianity is all blended together in a way that is completely inseparable. Christianity is not Christianity like anywhere else as it is in Ireland and paganism is more Christian than than you could imagine similarly in the same way that Haitian Voodoo uh, integrated Christianity like Santeria uh, in their forms when they left Africa and developed in America and Haiti Haiti of course <laughs> um, this phrase is perhaps the best single statement of the religious idea ideal that animated all of Yeats's works from the wanderings of Oshin to the death of Cahullin, and he was to use it to again nearly 40 years later in a vision. I did a huge series of lectures on that and breaking down the practical uh, method he very complicatedly describes in that. Unfortunately, the records of those lectures and the notes I made are lost in one of my home robberies. And uh, otherwise I would say some more about a vision here. Further, it offers a key to the symbolism of the Celtic mysteries, rituals, and suggests perhaps Yeats's purpose in the creation of his Celtic rites. And, uh, so basically, the 
the Celtic rites and initiation in that order were in part designed to reconcile the um, officially reconcile the form of Christianity and natural spirituality, that, that ecological spirituality that comes from the fairies and and pagan gods and wor really worship of landscape and sacred sites that is endemic to Ireland and Irish culture and people. I've been dragged in front of statues of Mary in the pouring rain on Inishmore and pleaded with to to pray to to the virgin goddess Mary in Latin for help that night uh, with some old Irish folk um, walking home from the bar after playing one night. To be told to pray to the virgin goddess Mary is exactly what I'm talking about. That is such an Irish demonstration of the way they've inter they integrated all the religions. <laughs> when Christianity came to Ireland, of course, the Druids were probably just like, all right, so this goes like that now, and this goes like that, and it's basically all the same thing. And the Christians were like, yeah, and the Druids were like, fair play, fucking right, let's do it, and they, they converted. Boom, no problem. They just brought their stuff into the Christianity and produced things like the Book of Kells. So, amen. The Celtic mysteries were a stage in the search for a vision of Eden and a style appropriate to express that vision which preoccupied Yeats Yeats's entire creative life. This search began with his apprentice works, which were pastoral in the conventional sense and consciously imitative. He was representing older Irish verse forms, ballads, and poetry, uh, from sonnets to, you know, Scottish ballads and Irish folk songs. In these, Yeats was fleeing a sordid mercantile world which debased everything it touched, including religion. Poetry, as he then saw it, was to be an escape from the drabness of reality and a sort of buffer against the pressing world. A long poem, he felt, should be a re region into which one could escape from, light, one, from life's cares. The characters should be no more real than shadows. The poems which resulted from Yeats's earliest poetic theorizings were full of longing and complaint. The innocence and peace they offered were out of time and space, unreal and unattainable in this world. They were, as he said, a summon to the, a flight into fairyland and were lacking in insight and knowledge. Even the wanderings of Oshin is nearly pure escapism. Although Nashina, Thurnout, and Arcadia have been replaced with the concrete imagery, characters and place names derived from Irish myth and the settings and mood express the same world sadness and longing for peace in the never-never land that the island of statues did. The early works which emphasized childlike innocence as the ideal were not long satisfying. By 1885, Yeats was beginning to feel that the woods of Arcady are dead, and over in their antique joy of all of old the world of on dreaming fed, grey truth is now her painted toy. Very Orem Poems, edition 645. His search for a style was beginning to lead him towards the concept of radical innocence. Sounds like Blake's high innocence, the third state of spiritual maturity the, the state of grace founded on experience and achieved not through turning away from the world but through immersion in it and transcendence of it yeah that's Blake's high innocence he was learning to take pleasure in the weed of life as well as the flower <clears throat> yeah he did like uh, weed and hashish yeah, more than peyote he mentioned once Yeats did that is uh, and to find it in it necessary truths apprehendable in no other way 